Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Dr. Sarah Baker and I serve on the USU ETE faculty committee. Um, our session this afternoon is going to explore how you can help your students with their research in a remote learning environment. And we'll talk about some modules, some tutorials, some uh, li liaison li librarians, and hopefully also uh, our, an excellent series of research guides, which I found on the, on the, the library webpage. Um, I'm going to be watching the chat and summarizing it periodically. So if you do have questions, go ahead and share them there. We're also planning some time at the end. So if that's more helpful for you, you can just save them then and just kind of speak them rather than try to get them into uh, typing um, and while also still listening. So our presenter today is Tegan Eastman. She's USU's librarians online learning librarian and her work focuses on helping librarians and instructors support students' research needs in online learning environments. So please, let's welcome Tegan. So hi, everybody. I hope you guys can all hear me. Um, I'm not very good at seeing the chat when I'm in a presentation mode, so if you can't hear me, put it in the chat and Sarah will let me know. Uh, but like she said, I'm gonna talk today about how you can incorporate um, information literacy or library research skills into your classes this fall. And I don't mind being interrupted throughout the presentation. I'm pretty good at stopping and kind of readjusting as we need to make this what works for you guys. So um, throughout the chat, just kind of ask any questions that you want and we can readjust accordingly. So here's a picture of me. If you can't see me in the video, just so you know what I look like, I'm not a floating voice. You might also hear my dog who has issues about guarding the house. He thinks everybody's gonna, you know, intrude upon us. So if he talks to us throughout that, I'm sorry, he has issues. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to talk about the importance of information literacy, how we can integrate these skills through a process called scaffolding, a little bit about who our librarians are at USU, how you can reach out to them, how we can help, and then topics we can help with, and how this might look this fall and in your classes. So in the library, we often hear our students described as digital natives. Um, we hear, oh, they've grown up with Google, so they're fine. They don't need research help. But there are a lot of problems and assumptions with this description, primarily that this assumes our students are a homogenous bunch, that they all come to us with the same experiences. And it also assumes that they're prepared to handle the digital discipline or the digital landscape in their disciplines. It assumes that um, just because they grew up with Google that they know how to do research in chemistry or in music or um, even in history, and that's not always the case. So as you are here today, I hope that you can let go of the idea of your students as digital natives and just realize that they do need help with the research process. So I like to think of um, this information from Project Information Literacy. So they did a survey of freshmen across the country, thousands of them, and they asked them a basic question. What is the most difficult part of, re of research for you guys? And 84% of them said the most difficult process is just getting started. Um, so that's really just a foundational problem for them. And if you think about that, if you can't get started, that really hurts every other step later on. If you don't know how to search or where to search or just even get started in general with keywords or anything like that, that hurts you every other step along the way. It has a trickle down effect. So they have a lot of anxiety about that. It also asks them where they're getting their information. 92% of them are still starting at a search engine, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with Google but um, they might hit a paywall. That might not be the best place to get the information that they need. Um, seven out of 10 students are still using Wikipedia most of the time. Again, nothing wrong with that, but it might not connect them with the best information. When I ask them where else they're going for information, 88% of them might use a database. 83% of them are gonna go to their instructor, but only 30% of them are going to a librarian. And when they broke that down a little bit more, it was really kind of anecdotally. Um, they were in the library for something else and they kind of stumbled upon a librarian. So when we think about how this might look this fall, a lot less people are probably gonna be in the library and also a lot less librarians are gonna be in the library. We're not gonna be at the research desk, so they're not gonna stumble upon us. So they're not gonna just kind of come to us for help and get that uh, assistance that they need. 
And we also hear a lot of the times that, oh, my students go to the library all of the time. They're always there, so they must be doing research. And they're not doing that. That's not the case. The library has a really broad, uh, it serves a lot of different purposes now. Um, it's a place to get technology. It's a computer lab. It's got a cafe. It's got study rooms. They're not just there to get our books or to access information anymore. They can do that anywhere. So what they're doing when they're there is checking messages, assignments, they're studying, they're meeting with friends, people go on dates there. Like, so just because I go to the library doesn't mean that they're um, talking with us or getting help from us. Um, when Project Information Literacy asks them how they feel about their assignments, they feel fear, angst, dread, annoyance, disgust, and overwhelming. Uh, so they don't feel good about these assignments. So we really need to be careful about how we present them to them and make sure that we're supporting them as we assign these to them. Some other assumptions specifically related to USU. Um, I hear a lot of times, I don't need to help my students because they get information literacy support in English 2010 or 1010. But a lot of students test out of English 1010 here at USU. So they never get those skills or um, it really depends on when they're going to take English 2010. You can take that anytime here. You could take that your last semester senior year. So you can't really count on a student in your uh, class having already taken English 2010 and have gotten those really important research skills when they're in your classroom. And if they're a distance ed student, um, so if they take a if they're taking your class as a regional campus student or a statewide student, you can't really have counted on them having gotten like a really solid um, composition research experience from the library because we don't integrate with them the same way. And like I said earlier, there's a real failure to apply research methods across the discipline. Chemistry research is a lot different than composition research and students really fail to apply those research methods across the discipline. So they, we know that students need relevant um, research method courses and research method support from a librarian. Another thing we know is that when we do integrate with courses is that we know that students learn better when library assignment or when library uh, integrations with your courses are timed with assignments. So not just at the beginning of the semester because that's convenient, um, but they also need to be relevant and interactive. So a lot of times we just are asked to do a database demonstration where we just get up and talk at a student, but it's better when it's interactive, when students have an opportunity to, to interactively participate in a discussion or test those skills and participate and authentically um, demonstrate that they've learned something. So how do we actually um, do this? How do we help you guys overcome some of these issues and support your students? In the library, we believe in a process called scaffolding. Essentially, we believe in collaborating with you to look at your assignments and think about all of the implicit tasks or tasks that maybe aren't as clear or straightforward that might really trip up your students. Tasks that you're asking students to complete and um, making them instead really explicit or cl really clear. So we believe in breaking down your assignments into their basic components, your research assignments, and creating mini assignments that support students in doing those implicit tasks. And when I mean mini assignments, I mean we would, uh, the mini assignments would be in conjunction with tutorials that the library already has. We would put those into your course and that, those would be the mini assignments that would support students in completing those implicit tasks. So I know that's kind of confusing. So let's think of that in um, the lens of an example that's pretty familiar to us. So when you assign a literature review for your students, this is pretty uh, standard. I think a lot of us know how to do a literature review. What are the implicit tasks that you're asking your students to complete when you assign a literature review? The steps in a process that a student um, has to do that we might consider automatic, but might not be immediately understood by a student. So if you guys wanna go ahead and throw some ideas in the chat box uh, about the implicit tasks, in a literature review. Try to read the chat. Mm -hmm. 
knowing appropriate databases. Yep, that's a good one. Okay, I have some already thought of that, so I'll just skip to that. So the ones that I think of when I think of implicit tasks in a literature review and that we see in the library a lot of times that students struggle with, they struggle to really choose a topic. So if you don't assign them a topic, uh, we know that getting started is really hard. They struggle to navigate library databases. So finding uh, where to search, um, what databases are relevant, and how to actually utilize those e efficiently. They struggle to find relevant information and then evaluate those uh, pieces of information for credibility, reliability, things like that. They really struggle to find or to read scholarly sources. Those aren't, uh, you know, BuzzFeed articles that they read daily. So reading those is a lot different than the things that they're used to reading. And then they struggle to synthesize the information that they're finding and turn it into something that's unique um, to them. So taking that and turning it into their own paper. So in the library, we believe in supporting each one of those tasks. So we have a tutorial on how to synthesize, how to read scholarly articles, how to navigate library databases. So um, we would support students in each one of these tasks and give them the opportunity to, to learn those skills, practice them, and get feedback on them if necessary before they turn in the literature review. So it gives them opportunity to practice, get feedback, and do better when they have to turn in that final literature review. So breaking down big tasks into smaller kind of uh, mini assignments. Another reason I think it's important to be deliberate about supporting students with mini assignments um, is that we think, uh, well, if students need help, they're gonna ask for it, right? Or if um, we hear this a lot, I gave them supplemental links, I put them in Canvas, um, they'll use them if they need them, right? In the library, we call this syncing just in case, where we provide links on our sites. In the library, we do this. We provide a bunch of links on our website just in case students stumble upon them. But we know based on our Google Analytics data that they don't access this information. It's how do they, they don't find it. They don't um, have any incentive to use it. And we know that students also have anxiety about reaching out to us because asking for help is hard. And we know that this fall that COVID is making everything a lot harder. So that's why we think that um, it's better to have a mindset of just in time where we create deliberate integrations with instructors that are integrated into their curriculum at the point of need. So that means in timed with assignments. So we embed the resources in Canvas and tie, to th tie them to some sort of point value for completion. And this has had the most success for us. So back to this example, um, if I wanted to really focus on helping students synthesize information, I would have them, you know, watch a tutorial on that, practice those skills, and then I would give them feedback on that, and they would have to do that by September 19th, and I would, they would have some sort of point value incentive for doing so. Instead of just linking out to that and hoping that they do it, um, there was an incentive to actually do so. So, how do we actually do this? How do you actually work with a librarian? What does it actually look like in practice? So the first thing you actually do, need to do is figure out who your librarian is. Luckily, every single uh, department at USU has a librarian that's uh, kind of trained in the resources for that area. So Sarah, you're in the music department. Your librarian is Rachel, she's amazing. So you can, in this meet with a librarian link, that's. I'll send you the link to this PowerPoint if you guys want it. Um, you just search for the discipline or the department that you're in, and then it'll pull up the librarian for that department. And then you can click meet with me and set up a meeting with the librarian. You could say, hi, I'm looking for help um, setting up some research help for my students this semester. And you could say, I want an online meeting, I want a face-to-face -face meeting. And that would help her kind of prepare for that meeting and know what kind of assignments maybe that you have for the fall. So every department has a librarian that can help you um, and knows kind of more about your disciplines. We also have a cur have curated list of e-learning resources relevant to each department. So we have spent a long time making um, specific resources that are 
relevant to um, every single discipline. So music e-learning, um, education e-learning resources. So instead of having to sift through a whole big list, you can just look at the e-learning resources that are relevant to that discipline. So an education source tutorial. So you could go through and say, here are some resources that I might be able to use for my course this fall. And then you could reach out to your librarian and say, hey, I think I want to use this in my course. Is this something that we could do? Is this something that you could help me put in Canvas? Um, maybe this isn't exactly what I want. Could you help me customize it? So it can help you kind of figure out what kind of things that we have. How could we better customize it to fit my assignment, my needs of my students? So um, we have different kinds of tutorials. It'll tell you more about them, videos, all sorts of fun stuff. The other thing we have, uh, just a general search e-learning e search. So every single e-learning object that we have, you can search here for that, if it'll load. So if you're not sure what you're looking for, but you're like, my students really struggle with synthesis. I'm not sure what department that falls in, but I know that my students really struggle with that. Um, you could say, just search here for this, and it will come up with a different resources we have for helping students with synthesis. It'll tell you the kind of things that we have. And here we have a video about synthesis and you can directly go find the video on synthesis. And then you can copy the URL and put it in your Canvas. So if you don't have time to reach out to a librarian, you can just directly connect with the resources. But librarians are pretty cool and you could reach out to them too. Okay, so how we can work with you. So there's three big categories. We can work with you to integrate directly into Canvas. We can create assignments, create a content page where we link out to stuff, make kind of larger modules um, with kind of, kind of mimicking what we might teach you, teach your students in a session. So kind of teaching in a page. We can make videos or link to videos. We can monitor discussion boards, create group activities. We can do Zoom or IVC sessions. So this would be basically what we would do in a face-to-face -face session. We can make them more interactive by using breakout rooms or some of the more interactive things like using polls. Or we can do consults, which are one-on-one -on -one research uh, meetings with students. And I'm gonna go into each of these a little bit more and show you some of the resources. So interactive tutorials. So one of the big things that we um, do or help students figure out how to search in databases. So this is one of the things we know that students really struggle with. So we have Canvas integrated tutorials. So we have all of these different databases. So one for pretty much every de department on campus. And what is great about these is that we can put them as an assignment in Canvas and they're auto graded. So if you decide, hey, I want one of these in my course, uh, we create it as an assignment. You say, I want this as 10 points. And once students complete it, uh, it automatically uh, goes into that student's gradebook as 10 points. And it walks students through how to use the database and asks them to actually um, go through and do it and then ask questions. There's multiple choice. There's quick response where they have to actually answer questions, come up with subtopics, alternate keywords, things like that. So we do a lot of these. Um, I think last semester we reached like 3,000 students with these. This fall we're probably going to reach a lot more because we're doing a lot of these. So what I do a lot is have students do one of these, do the tutorial like this, and then I monitor a discussion board like what do you still have, what kind of questions do you still have about this, what are some interesting things that you learned, what's a topic that you're interested in. So I use this kind of as a starting point to reach out to students. Um, but they're a pretty good way to get students to interact with the database. And I'll show you what it looks like in Canvas in a second. But we have them on pretty much every database, every major database, and we can customize them to better fit uh, your needs. So if you want something um, in the communication uh, and mass media complete, you want something on annotated resources or annotated bibliographies, we could add that in there pretty easily. So an example of what an assignment would look like. So I talked about how these are auto graded in Canvas. So here it is in Canvas. So it's just automatically integrated here. So it asks students to open it up in Canvas. 
the way that it works is if I can resize my screen, it asks them to have the tutorial open and then to open up the tool in another window. So they search along in the database over here and then follow along in the database. And once they finish, it just automatically opens up in the gradebook. It's pretty fancy. And then what I have students do after this one is because it's Zotero, I have them upload a bibliography when they're done. And then I look at their bibliography. They tell me what their topic is and I'm like, oh, hey, maybe you should look at these articles or check out this database. So then I can give them feedback like that. So that's that. Um, so yeah, assignment feedback allows them to give feedback from me um, afterwards. Another one uh, that I do a lot is one of my classes that I work with in SPUR a lot is a class that really struggled with uh, identifying empirical research. So I added to an education source tutorial a lot of content on empirical research. So they do the education source tutorial and then here they need to upload uh, the citation for two empirical research articles and then provide a paragraph um, explaining why the article is relevant to them. And then I provide via the speed grader feedback. I'm like, hey, you know, this article is not empirical and, uh, you know, maybe check out this. And that gives them time um, before the end of the semester when the final assignments do where they actually have to find like eight empirical research articles to better identify empirical research. So I give them tips on better identifying empirical research and they're um, able to to fix that um, process before the final assignments do. So that's some of the benefits of scaffolding is that they get the feedback and are able to kind of grow those skills before the final assignment is due. Another thing we do is discussion boards. So we're able to allow students to uh, interact with their peers, interact with us, they can respond to a topic. Um, we can just give them feedback. The important thing about these interactive things is that it's really only possible in classes with 30 students or less, unless you're going to group your students together and have them um, be in partners or groups, because we can't really give feedback to a lot of students. It's not really feasible for us. So unless you have smaller class sizes, the feedback portion of this is not really possible. So here's an example of a discussion board that I've done before. So students, um, it's for primary sources, so it's for a history class. They pick one of the primary source types and they have to write a one paragraph um, response on how they envision using that primary source to support the research topic. So they need to make sure that they indicate what type of primary source they've chosen and what their research topic is. And then I respond to them and I'm like, oh, hey, that's really great. Did, have you ever thought about using this kind of research or this kind of resource? I linked out to some of the specific stuff that we have in our collection from special collections that they might be interested in. And then I also had um, students respond to each other about um, different ideas that they had as well. So I was able to give them feedback and they were also able to respond to each other. And then group and partner activities. It's the same thing here with um, discussion boards, but this time I was able to put them directly into pairs in Canvas. So another history class. So they're using the discussion board with their partner to discuss a primary source that they've been assigned. They use the guided questions below to analyze their primary source with their partner and each partner um, participates so they have to use these questions and then they look at the primary source and re respond below. So that's another fun example. Um, we also have a bunch of tutorials that we can just automatically integrate into your Canvas course. Things like plagiarism and citing sources, which we get a lot, reading scientific articles, lit reviews. So these have quizzes that are auto-graded um, and a lot of content like videos, pages with um, screenshots, fun examples, a lot of Beyonce, a lot of Game of Thrones, fun stuff. So an example of what one of these looks like, um, reading scientific articles. This is something a lot of students struggle with. So interactive things throughout that they have to do. 
videos, breaking down how to read articles, and then there is a quiz on the fourth page, I think. So you, if you wanted something like this, we could put in your um, class to teach students how to do this so they gain those skills of how to read a scientific article. So we have a bunch of these tutorials that are pre-made that you can integrate and help support students on those kind of topics. So we have one on literature reviews, which was my example that I talked about earlier. Um, the research consult. So um, for students that maybe need more one-on-one -on -one help that maybe um, do better with kind of just talking one-on-one -on -one or need more in-depth um, assistance, we can do um, sit downs with them via Zoom. Um, this is kind of ideal for maybe students that are really struggling with their research. This is not recommended as a mandatory assignment. We've had people assign this as like extra credit before, so please don't do that. Um, we can highlight this in an announcement. So if you um, know when your assignment's due, you can say, hey librarian, can you come into my announcements, introduce yourself as my class librarian, remind students that their lit review is done and that you can help them. So I do that all the time and just get a few consults from students that really need some extra help. So just a good way to let them know, let your students know that they have a librarian that's there to help them. And then again, we can do Zoom or IV session, IVC sessions to give them more of a synchronous session with their um, librarian. If you want something like this, just email your librarian to set it up. And we get this question, can my librarian teach face-to-face? -face? This really depends on your librarian's preference. Um, so reach out to your specific librarian for your department. It also depends on the size of your class and whether um, you'd want to come to the library. We have really limited um, classroom space and classrooms. So if that's a, a factor too, so work that out with your librarian. If you'd rather just stay in your designated classroom, that's maybe a little bit easier to work out. But the main thing is librarian preference. If they don't feel comfortable doing that, then we can't um, make them do that. So now the rest of the time is just for questions and I can show specific tutorials for you guys. If you guys have specific tutorials that you guys want to look at. Chat. Okay. I try to save at least 10 minutes. Was I right on time, Sarah? 15 minutes. Oh, perfect. Even better. I'll send the link to my PowerPoint too, so you guys have all the links for this. So one thing that uh, comes up in my classes, and I don't know if this will be relevant to other um, listeners right now, but I'm interested, um, yeah. is uh, issues of copyright. So yeah. um, do, are there tutorials on that or what kind of resources would you recommend that we share with students and that we use ourselves as preparing, yeah. as we prepare? Yeah, I think the best thing for copyright is because it's so situational is to reach out mm -hmm. to our copyright librarian. So let me send you her, her email. Um, I think she's awesome, and we do have a copyright lib guide, so I'll send that too. But um, I think the best case is to ask somebody because most of the time there's fair use or some sort of. It's so squishy, yeah. copyright know. is. Yeah. So getting advice from somebody that's an expert is really the, the best case scenario. I'm going to send this to you. We have a copyright page that has her, her info um. and other information here. So it's got copyright basics and uh, a link to her info. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I still don't understand copyright and <laughs> I've been a librarian for a while. <laughs> I think with copyright, like if you try like if you if you try and demonstrate some like goodwill, you're like that seems to be a good cover. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll quote you on that. <laughs> yeah, you can quote me. Like when you get <laughs> when they get sued, be like, you know, my librarian said you if you try. You just said try. <laughs> I think that's what like legal people say. Like if you tr 
try. <laughs> yeah. Like, I feel like people are always trying to like check every box of a copyright law. And I don't think you can, can do that because there's not like a checklist, you know? Yeah. 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 So did you do say there was a tutorial in this page? Yeah, so if you go, it's copyright basics, mm -hmm. understanding the law, like understanding copyright users, all that stuff is on here. Okay. Training and links. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Well, uh, maybe we'll just end the session now. And if people have questions, they can email you. Is your email address or contact information on the site page? Yeah, it is. But like I think we just got one. Easy a question from oh, Jen. Great, great. I'm looking at the lib guides, for example, on evaluating sources under biology. How do you integrate something like that into your own Canvas course? Yeah. Uh, Jen, can you send me the link to what you're looking at? I think you're on the biology learning resources page, I think. How about I send you what I think you're on? And you tell me, how about I share my screen of what I, can you guys still see my you screen? You are still, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Are you on this page, Jen? She says yes. Yes, okay. Are you looking at this, this tutorial right here, evaluating sources? Or is it a video? I don't think there's a, hang on. Oh, she says, okay. hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if you want that in your course, here, I can put that in your course for you. Shoot me an email and I'll get that in your course today. <laughs> it's really easy. You just add me to your campus course real quick and then I just put it in under your modules page. Yeah. Are there any other then, questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sarah, Sarah, to answer your question, there's my email. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, I will be the only clapper unless the two of you want to un unmute yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes the ETE conference. And so I, I hope that you've been able to take things that are useful from this presentation and other things that you've seen throughout the, the conference. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, Vegas.